Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this afternoon's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual. I'm Maya, your host, and we are excited to be presenting KW Writers Alliance Writers on Reading, a discussion of the importance of reading in shaping a writer's work in partnership with the KW Writers Alliance. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Toronto, is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honors these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. And just a few announcements before we introduce today's panelists. I mentioned off the top that this is the second virtual Word on the Street Festival in our 32 year history. And that's not strictly true because this year's celebration also includes four days of in-person author signings at local bookstores. We'll be at another story bookshop today with more coming later this week. Check out our website or our Instagram Reels page to see the signing schedule for all the shops. And don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels. This is the fourth day of our festival uh, celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Earlier today, we streamed Diaspora Dialogues in conversation with Anashirani and John Krasank, a discussion of their new dramas, as well as our panel with the KW Writers Alliance on oral st storytelling, discussing the relevance of the tradition today, which can be found on our YouTube channel, The Word on the Street Toronto. For information on our upcoming panels, visit our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you wanna be the first to know about new videos from The Word on the Street, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoy today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. Now I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator for this panel, Caroline Topperman. Caroline is a European Canadian writer, entrepreneur, dancer, and world traveler. She is the managing editor for Non-Binary Review and co-founder of the KW Writers Alliance. Her book credits include Tell Me What You See and Fitwise. She has written articles for Huffington Post Canada and was the beauty editor for British Mode magazine. Welcome, Caroline. It's so great to have you here this Thank afternoon. You. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's very nice to see you again. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And I'll uh, leave it to you uh, to introduce our panelists. Great. Thank you. And I just wanted to take a second, since we are representing KW, or Waterloo Region, um, I wanted to acknowledge that Waterloo Region is part of the Haldimand Tract, which is traditional territories of the Neutral, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, and our panel will start with Kate Johnston, um, or E.K. Johnston, as you may know her. Uh, Kate had several jobs and one vocation before she became a published writer. If she's learned anything, it's that things turn out weird sometimes and there's not a lot you can do about it. Well, that's how to muscle through, well, that and how to muscle through awkward fanfic uh, because it's about a pairing she likes. Her books range from contemporary fantasy to fairy tale reimaginings, from hopeful sci-fi to quiet epics, and from small town Ontario to a galaxy far, far away. She has no plans to rein anything in. Welcome, Kate. Thank so you. happy to speak with you today. Um, Aaron Bow is a physicist turned poet turned children's novelist, whose honors include the TD Canadian Children's Literature Award, the CBC Literary Award for Poetry, and the Governor General's Award. Her novels for young readers include Plain Kate, The Scorpion Rules, and Stand on the Sky. She lives in Kitchener. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next, we have Mariam Pirbai who is a professor of English in the Department of English and Film Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University, where she specializes in post-colonial studies, diaspora literatures, and creative writing. She is the author of a debut short story collection titled Outside People and Other Stories. She's the winner of the 2018 Ippy 
International Publishers Gold Medal for Multicultural Fiction, winner of the 2019 American Book Fest Award for the short story, and ranked among CBC's top 10 must-read books of 2017. She is also the author and editor of several academic works on the global South Asian diaspora, including Mythologies of Migration, Vocabularies of Indenture, Novels of the South Asian Diaspora in Africa, the Caribbean, and Asia Pacific. She has recently completed a first novel depicting Islamophobia as it impacts a diverse community of Muslim Canadians settled in Toronto and Montreal. Her current projects also include a series of creative nonfiction essays exploring questions of land, settlement, and belonging in the Grand River region from her perspective as an emigre settler, an exploration that she has also started to take up more informally in painting. Welcome. And finally, we have Tannis McDonald, who is a poet, nonfiction writer, and professor. Her book, Out of Line, is a guide for playing the long game in the literary world. And her most recent book, Mobile, was the only book of poetry long listed for the 2020 Toronto Book Awards. Welcome, everyone. And I'm so happy to have everybody here. And this is really exciting for me from a very... Um, for a very selfish reason, because I love talking about books, <laughs> and I love to actually hear about what other writers are reading. Um, and so as we start, I just wanted to let you know that um, it's really, your recommendations matter. I just wanted to say that <laughs> um, officially. It's pretty funny because about 18 months ago when the whole world stopped, um, Tannis started posting books that she was reading and her recommendations. and. Mm -hmm. Here's a fan who follows. <laughs> um, and one of the books that um, Tannis recommended actually just sent me on a huge spiral down an 18 month long rabbit hole of reading. Um, and I, you know, I'm coming out on the other end, hopefully. Um, I think, you know, I think it's made me a better person. It's certainly influenced my writing. Um, and just one book leading into the next book has been so amazing. So um, this is for all of you. If you want to post what you're reading on social media, you'll have at least one very ardent follower. <laughs> Caroline, I have to know what book it was yeah um it was uh Sonia Boone and it was what the oceans oh. remember what yeah. a terrific book yeah, yeah. so I highly recommend it yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 it's it's uh it definitely I think it really influenced my writing for the past year or two so Excellent. wherever you are Sonia thank you um <laughs> so I'm going to start off today with a very controversial question that's you know very divisive will break apart you know the whole panel um <laughs> Ebooks or physical books? What do you prefer? <laughs> uh, we can start with. I'll start with Tannis since first reaction. <laughs> I, um, mostly physical books um, because I actually, you know, I love the the tactility of it, the the smell and and the and the look of them. But of course, like I think so many people, whenever I travel, I'm really glad to have an ebook that uh, doesn't take up uh, room in my bag. And I I just read Pamela Dean's The Dubious Hills on. Um, an, an ebook that I, you know, it was on my my uh, iPad when I when I was caught stranded at an airport and ended up reading the whole thing. So I'm I'm grateful for uh, to ebooks for existing, uh, but ninety percent of the time I'm I'm physical book. Uh, Kate, Others? <laughs> um, I'm probably much closer to a 50-50 split right now, which I never thought would happen. Um, but it turns out like a combination of like travel and then getting into the habit of reading on ebooks, reading a bunch of advanced copies um, because they're digital only um, and also a wrist injury. Because uh, it turns out when you read like doorstop fantasy novels, it's not like handy when you have like a wrist problem. Right. Um, so I'm much closer to a 50-50 split than I ever imagined I would be. And I still love them both. And there's really nothing like logging onto Twitter in the morning, finding out what romance novel is on sale, buying it and being like, there's my afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna just go in order of how I see you on my screen. So um, Aaron. Uh, like Kate, I'm closer to 50-50. And like Kate, I'm like, what happened to my beautiful book babies? Um, the pandemic <laughs> has changed it, though, because um, I used to go to the library once a week and grab 
And now I'm like, what's on Libby and what's available? Um, and it's really changed the way I read because that's how I get my library books. And um, someday when I'm rich and famous, I do intend to buy hard physical copies of all the books I want to read. Uh, but right now it's, it's handy. And uh, it does kind of keep my shelves a little bit more clear. I don't know. I think I think reading is reading, and we we do people a disservice when we get too precious about it. Agreed. It's just you know, it's one of those questions, and I can see yeah. um, I can see Mariam's library behind her. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my library says it all. So if if we're talking percentages, I would say. I'm 80, 20, 80 for the physical books, 20 for the eBooks. And for, you know, I appreciate the, the sort of, um, the way eBooks have democratized literature in many ways, right? They've made them more accessible. Um, I love the way that we have access to the classics now in digitized form. And, and so I like that aspect of eBooks, but I think when it comes down to it, I still, need that tactile relationship <laughs> with books and you know ebooks don't make the best gifts <laughs> i still rely on books for you know to give gifts and um and to share so i i think just that sort of interpersonal connection that that physical books um afford are are some for me you know make uh the physical book um, kind of um a process of communion, whereas the ebook is more like um, a matter of convenience. Makes sense, makes sense, definitely. Um, so now on to the real questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I want I I really want to know um, what what you look for in a book. I mean, are you, do you pick up a book just for the pure enjoyment of it? Um, or are you looking for books to, you know, for lack of a better word, to like make you smarter to, to that you're trying to learn something from what's, what, are, what are you sort of looking for when you pick up your books or when you're doing like your book recommendations and all of that? Um, does anyone want to start or? I mean, I can, I can go first. Sure. <laughs> I don't know which one of us. You yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go um, ahead, Kate. <laughs> for me, again, it kind of depends on why I'm reading. Um, like if I'm reading for uh, work, if I'm reading to blurb a book or to help someone edit a book, I want, you know, something that's engaging, something that's fun, something that I love. Um, if I'm reading for fun, I sometimes I want something really familiar, like a fantasy novel that's just like, you know, the same 15 tropes over and over and over again. And like, I love that. And then sometimes... I do want to get smarter. Like I want to, to, to become sort of, to keep my mind open and to learn more things. And every once in a while you hit a book that like hits that sweet spot of everything. Um, I just finished one beats of prey by Anna Gray. It comes out next week, I think. Um, and it's really good and it's also really fun. And I think for me, that's what it comes down to is something that I can engage with. Uh, Tannis. Um, I think, you know, this idea of reading just for enjoyment or to make yourself smarter, I think I enjoy making myself smarter. So <laughs> part of, part of that is, is happening, right? Um, and every, yeah, and every once in a while you, um, yeah, I like uh, Kate's idea of the sweet spot. And I'm going to name, um, I just finished uh, Ringo Rowell's uh, Simon Snow trilogy. So I just read Anywhere the Wind Blows. Mm -hmm. And while I'm enjoying the fact that it is like a kind of fantasy, it's also about uh, human relationships. Um, and I, yeah, I, I feel like I came out of that thinking uh, with all kinds of questions about gender and sexuality and trauma. So it was um, a, a, a book I read thinking I was reading it for enjoyment, but I also got all this other stuff going on as well. Um, all these other good questions out of it. Um, and I also note that um, because sometimes I, I, I read, uh, yeah, about distressing subjects uh, a lot, I've, I have a little resolution for the fall that I'm going to um, make sure that I always have a, uh, a comedy on the go, a comedic book, <laughs> right? And then I continue all my other reading practices, but I always have that go-to comedic book um, to uh, resort to when, uh, when I really need that for my brain. So yeah, that's part of what's going on for me right now. 
I like that. That's that's good. Have that happy book on the side. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, Mariam? Um, yeah, well, all of the above. I think that sweet spot is, is really important, um, what Kate was talking about. And I guess for me, um, <clears throat> it sort of stems from my research and my teaching. And, and I think just sort of always having an eye to underrepresentation. So I'm always looking for books that are by authors who don't necessarily, you know, make the, the hit list. And we can talk about it later, sort of the big mm -hmm. you know, must read lists. And so this idea of uh, underrepresentation, moving out of um, like uh, the canon, you know, trying to tease out works that um, are by smaller presses or authors who are published by smaller presses as well, indie presses, um, trying to break ourselves out perhaps of um, books that become over recommended. And so, yeah, this questions of underrepresentation perhaps um, drives many of um, at least my own um, motivations for seeking out new books um, or different books and alternate voices. But ultimately, I think you can, you know, you, anything you read can potentially make you smarter. And I would say, if only because it takes us out of ourselves and exposes us to a different perspective, right? A different voice, different perspective. Um, and, and, and popular genres too. I think, you know, all of these hierarchies, we need to sort of do away with them because like a great romance novel or a great work of crime fiction too, all of it has the potential to make us smarter. If only that, you know, just considering the amount of research that goes into books um, like this, or perhaps thinking through craft and, um, you know, different techniques perhaps if you're approaching it um, from the perspective of a writer. So everything has the potential to make us smarter, I think. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Aaron? Well, I am almost tempted to let Miriam have the last word on that. <laughs> um, I think books are like food. You go to them for different reasons. And sometimes you want mashed potatoes. And sometimes you want to try something brand new. Um, I will say, and this is kind of a controversial take, that unless I'm reading it for a specific reason, like it's for some reason or another assigned to me, if it's research that I'm digging facts out of, if I don't like it, I ain't finishing it. Mm. Yeah, if it's if it doesn't catch my engagement, if it doesn't engage me, it's just like food. If if I take a couple bites of it and it's it's not for me, then it's not for me. And sometimes it's literally not for me, it's for somebody else. And, you know, I think we need to, as readers giving recommendations, um, you know, kind of have that in the back of your head. That it's like, this one didn't work for me, but I think it might really work for you. Um, yeah, I, I read different things for different reasons. Um, and I like Kate and like, uh, I think everyone else kind of like it when you're reading it and then it surprises you by fulfilling more than one need. That's the best. That's actually, I'm like really glad that you went, that you said that now because <laughs> it's, um, I found this quote and okay, it's, it's Francis Bacon, um, but I love this and I hope you all, I think everybody kind of will agree that. So um, he said, he writes, uh, some books are to be tasted, others to be swallowed, and some few to be chewed and digested. That is, some books are to be read only in parts, others to be read but not curiously, and some to be read wholly and with diligence and attention. So I think that kind of sums that up, right? And mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, I, I kind of, I really like that. I really resonate, that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. um, so on that line, um, with the books that are catching your attention or not. I know that I've, I've heard this over the last 18 months when the world stopped um, far too often. And it, it made me sad actually to hear it. But um, so many people were saying they just couldn't read. They just stopped reading. It was mm -hmm. just, that was it. Um, I, I was the complete opposite. So I couldn't really understand it. That was somehow that was the one thing that could focus my mind. Um, but I'm just wondering, have any of you ever gotten what we'll call reader's block? Um, like, how would you recommend, if, if so, how would you recommend getting past that? Um, 
kind of what the thought process is behind that. And I know we're all being really polite. If anybody yeah. really <laughs> wants to jump in, it's okay. I'm um, and I'm happy calling on you guys. <laughs> I, was say, I always have an answer. So yeah, I'm dead. great. Well, <laughs> in the early days of the pandemic, I found that I couldn't read. I mean, it was just, oh, it was, it was a disaster in my house. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple of teenagers and it was just kind of like, yeah. um, but I did find eventually that I could reread. And so I pulled old favorites off the shelf and started rereading them. I also, for some reason, read all the plague literature in my house. I reread the Doomsday Book and I reread Station Eleven. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, could be worse, I guess. Uh, keep looking at me like, you did what? I, uh, I'm not surprised. No, no, it's not really very surprising if you know me. Uh, I think that was my ticket out was to reread like you know I also think reading doesn't have to be it's a joy for me but it's not an assignment for me if I don't get it done I, I try not to feel a lot of guilt like professionally there are a lot of things like inside my community I'm a YA writer but there are far more books that I would love to read that I just can't possibly have time to read so I'm just gonna let that go <laughs> and I'm gonna read for joy. And if I can't read, I'm gonna say, oh, I missed the joy, but I'm gonna try not to take on the guilt. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no guilt, mm -hmm. no guilt. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, go ahead, Kate. <laughs> okay, I definitely stopped reading at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and at first I was like, oh, I'll just stop reading for work. And then I couldn't do that either. And then I just literally read nothing but romance novels for two months, which was a great idea. Um, and I think the thing about romance novels and the reason it had to be romance novels and not anything else was because that genre is 100% happy endings. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes the person who's a jerk gets punched in the face, uh, which is just like, you know, an extra bonus. And so, um, I, I, you all, I had that formula to look forward to every time, no matter how like ridiculous the antics they got up to, you knew that everything was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then I watched a lot of food shows on Netflix. <laughs> 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 like all of them. It's, it's about food. I have watched it on Netflix. <laughs> um, but not the like competition ones, just the like history of food mm -hmm. ones. Okay. Um, and like, a lot of them aren't in English and like all that kind of stuff. So I count that as reading because I was reading the subtitles. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was kind of what got me back into it. I guess it kind of like re reawakened my curiosity, I guess. Um, and then I just started reading again, fantasy novels because fantasy novels always have ridiculous food in them. Um, and that was kind of how I got back into reading during the pandemic, romance, food, books with food in it. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a bit of a, it's time to talk about mental health. I had a bit of an anxiety crack up at the start of the pandemic, right? Once I, once I finished caring for all of my students, I sort of said, well, that piece is done. And then I fell apart. Um, and so I, it was very distressing for me to not be able to read during that time. Um, because reading has always been my my safe space, and I didn't have that safe space anymore, except for Elizabeth McCracken's novel Niagara Falls all over again, which I've already read three times, and that was the only thing I could read for two weeks. So I read it, and I reread it, and I reread it, and about the end of two weeks, I could just sneak out of it and start to read other things, but it was strange. And I know I've heard other people talk about finishing a degree and not being able to read anymore, right? Because the act of reading has changed for them and then they need a, like a kind of hiatus. And then um, a, a professor I had said that she uh, she started reading again by reading Ag Agatha Christie because she she wanted the formula and she and she wanted to see the kind of the kind of care she took with that formula. So that was illuminating for her. But yeah, I needed something really familiar and just to stay with it for a long time. Yeah, for me too. I think I too had um, a reader's block. I think I'm just crawling out of my reader's block and. Um, what I tend to do is if I have a reader's block or a writer's block, I've been turning to painting 
Um, oh. And I just find, you know, just allowing myself to have that that block and focusing on something else is also, you know, um, not a bad thing sometimes. But um, the, there are two books that really um, helped or are helping me, actually. One of them I'm in the process of reading, um, sort of have broken me out of my reader's block. One of them was um, Shani Mutu's Polar Vortex, which was the first novel. I teach fiction. I'm a fiction gal. I write fiction. I teach fiction. And I was not able to read any novels, any fiction. And then that was the work for some reason that broke me out of my spell a few months back. And another book um, that took me completely out of my wheelhouse is Robin Wall Kamara's Braiding Sweetgrass. And it's this incredible creative nonfiction work from the perspective of a botanist, um, um, who basically um, talks about all the things that we've been doing during the pandemic, pandemic, going on nature walks, you know, sort of reconnecting with the natural world um, in ways that perhaps we haven't um, before or for a very long time. But she does it through an indigenous sensibility. And um, and so that really just resonated with me. And, and it, again, it just took me somewhere completely different from what I'm used to. So maybe that's another kind of trick, you know, just trying to read something that's completely outside your um, comfort zones. You know, if you're a poetry um, reader, read fiction. If you're a fiction reader, read CNF or um, uh, some other genre or form. That's interesting. So it almost sounds like some of you, it, it's almost like cross training, right? When <laughs> you just went to something completely different that brought you back. I, I yeah. completely, completely understand that. Um, so how do you find your next read? Um, so for me, it's just a, a lot of them. Actually, it's funny. Um, I when you know when you're scrolling through books on different websites and they're like if you like this maybe you'd like this one that's what I do I fall into these crazy rabbit holes of books like that um, or I just go and check out people's websites too and social media recommendations <laughs> they're good um, so I'm just wondering how how you go about finding the next book since we can't go stand in a bookstore for three hours and Twitter. Oh, okay. <laughs> anybody and anybody in particular i mean we're here um, to give recommendations I mean, right? most of the people i follow on twitter are authors and i've been friends with them for almost 10 years now which is kind of incredible um and i've been friends with them long enough that i know if not necessarily if one person likes a book I'm not necessarily gonna like it, but if two people like the same book, it's like a crossover for me. Um, and so the YA community, um, when we're not busy lighting ourselves on fire, does a pretty good job of book recommendations on Twitter. Um, they try, they tend to think outside the box. You are gonna get a YA recommendation probably, but um, it's a really good way to recommend books. Um, Heidi Hellig is probably my favorite for recommendations. And then of course, Dahlia Adler, if you're less, uh, less of a genre reader, more into fiction. Um, but it was funny when you said like, how do, how do you find your next books? I'm like, they find me, they show up at my door, <laughs> they arrive, um, which is also true because people send me books now. That's awesome. Which is really the dream. Like, yeah. if you're told, like, Tiny Kate, like, someday they'll just mail them to you, you'd be like, cool. Uh, <laughs> living the dream. You can't see it, but there's, like, stacks of them everywhere. That's fantastic. I'm totally jealous. I'm going to come And I get mine you. from Kate. Yeah. I, like, <laughs> in your house, and I'm like, here's my grocery bag. What am I going to like next? <laughs> I literally have a bag full of books from Kate on my I shelf was looking, right now. I, I was looking at my shelf, and I was like, What's missing? And I realized it was per of the Orange Street because it's like this big. And then I was like, where, where is that? Who would borrow? Oh, Aaron. Aaron. <laughs> so you heard that here, everyone. Um, the place to go for books is Kate, apparently. <laughs> I always have a recommendation. I'm on my way. Yeah. <laughs> books are very communal, right? We get our yeah. readers. I get my books basically by talking to my friends. 
who also mm -hmm. like books. And all my friends also like books because I mean, it's a very self-selecting circle, right? <laughs> I, I don't think I'm actually friends with anyone who doesn't read books. Um, That's good. If I am, I probably need to find out because it's kind of a deal breaker. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's something it's like more accounting. It's mostly and word of mouth for me especially now that I can't go and browse the library shelves or I can't go talk to uh, Dave at Wordsworth could usually hook me up. <laughs> Dave, I miss you. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's very social. It's very, I, I do buy the odd book from BookBub from the discount book list that I get every day. Um, but apart from that, it's, it's mostly personal recommendations. Um, Myself as well. If Natalie Foy or um, Carrie Claire is touting a book, I'm 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 looking it up and finding out about it. Um, and I have, have been a big library user during the pandemic because, of course, all I have to do is go online, see if they have it, and, mm -hmm. and order it up. So I've been the queen of the request page for mm -hmm. uh, really for the last eighteen months. And I also. Uh, if they don't have it, I suggest that they need to order it in for, for myself and, well, everyone else to read it. So uh, some things I just think, you know, the library needs to have uh, these kinds of things. And, uh, and of course, sometimes I, I, I buy, it, buy it for myself. Um, and I'm also uh, someone who reads uh, I Will Be a Completist. So um, I read Maggie O'Farrell's I Am, I Am, I Am in 2019 and uh, then... I uh, have been read, reading everything she's written. So I do that, that idea where I, where I, just, I just follow it. My rabbit hole is very specific, everything she's, read, she's written. And then I, actually, I also will read uh, interviews with, um, with favorite writers and read what they recommend as well, yeah. right? Yeah, I think um, much like Tanis, looking to, um, fellow writers, uh, friends, as Erin was saying, they're all my my best resources. And Facebook, and thank God for people like Tanis. It was from Facebook that I got the recommendation for the book that I just mentioned by Robin Wall Um So yeah, I'm not on Twitter, so I guess I'm missing out on a lot of recommendations. Uh, okay. So <laughs> Facebook has really, um, been a wonderful, I would say, a wonderful um, platform for book recommendations. One yeah, more that's a yeah. uh, random plug to the new project in in our community in Kitchener Waterloo, which is the Little Free Diverse Libraries. Um, there's one on one of my walks, and I often poke my nose in there and um, and see stuff that's like, oh yeah, I meant to read that, but it kind of fell off the back of my list because I don't keep up with that. And I would love to read that. And I pick it up and I read it. I just read New Kid, which everybody loved and everybody should read. It's a wonderful book. It's a graphic novel for middle graders that won the Newbery. Um, oh, thanks for that recommendation. Oh, it's great. And I am taking it back to the uh, Little Free Diverse <laughs> Library in Belmont Village. Um, the, the second I do shortly or just came out. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mm. think. Um, yeah, I think it's for, just for out. I have a graphic. She knows, she knows what she's getting into. Mm -hmm. I put it on. I put it on reserve at the library, though. <laughs> I do buy books. Uh, just you know, not quite as many as I would like to. Um, I think that particular program is kind of a nice way for me to push myself a little bit because you know. I'm a white lady, I'm friends with a lot of other white ladies, and one can accidentally replicate one's own identity and experience without meaning to, if you don't push on it just a little bit. And that's, I think, it's such a fun community project, and it's one way that I do that. Yeah, no, I, like, I, I think that's fantastic. And I mean, all those free libraries, I used to work in a library. Um, I met my husband in a library, you know, like this. So I'm, I'm a big fan of all libraries. I know he's probably listening now and like freaking out that I said that, but <laughs> I'm a big fan. And I, and I agree completely with that idea of really, um, I think Mariam talked about it earlier too, about getting out of your own boundaries and out of your, mm -hmm. um, you know, the box that we all have naturally mm -hmm. and just really pushing past that. Um, yeah, just Little Free Diverse Libraries is a particular program where it's by yes. spotlighting books by authors of color. And it's kind of a, you're supposed to borrow it and then take it back there. And I also take the stuff 
So it's like, I loved this, but I maybe don't want it on my shelf forever, but now I have the perfect place for it. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, yeah, and I think that's fantastic. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm going through my books now too to see what I can bring out mm -hmm. for more people to read that I don't necessarily need. And I move, I move like every couple of years too. So I'm so used to donating books. <laughs> um, do it. Makes me a little sad, but I know somebody else, they're making somebody else happy. Um, so this is a completely different question, but um, so I'm one of those people that if you, if you pick up one of the books that I've lent you and you like, open it up and crack the spine, my, I get heart palpitations. <laughs> um, but, and, but when I'm reading books, um, and especially in this last year when a lot of my books have been for study, um, they all have a thousand sticky notes in them because that's how I do it. Like I have sticky notes and a pen and there's this constant, I'm, I feel like I'm constantly working while I'm reading, which I, I love. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, do you take notes while you read? Um, you know, physically, what what do you do? Do you write in the margins? Do you bed? Do you, are you one of those people that folds down the page? I can see my name's book. <laughs> um, when I was studying, I used sticky notes um, and underlined in the book because it was textbooks, and I was trying to break myself of being materialistic it didn't work it was a phase in university um and but now um this is gonna sound really weird but it's been a while since I read a book for that kind of research right. um usually usually I'm after the vibe as the kids say um and so I don't like I don't really take notes um however I often highlight things by accident in ebooks so I'm sure if you go on onto my Kindle account, you're like, man, this, this lady has a really strange reading tastes and habits because she's got some strange things highlighted and it's, it's all accidental. People can see that? Oh yeah, you oh, can make them public. That's why when it says like 11, 11 people have highlighted this passage, right? Like that's oh, what I mean. Yeah. Hmm. No, but I showed you mine just because, yeah, I want you know, I, I, I want you to- That's beautiful, that's yeah. beautiful. That's so great. Want, it's because it's part of the, it's really pathological. This is what I'm trying to say. It's the it's the sort of the pathology of our profession as as teachers and I guess as researchers. So when I read for pleasure, like this is one of the books I teach. And by the way, fantastic book by I don't know if you can see that Michelle Cliff. She's a Caribbean or was um, a Caribbean writer um, from Jamaica, and. When I read for pleasure, I, I really don't want the post-it notes and the highlighting and the margin notes. And I, I it's my form of rebellion for that kind of pathological, <laughs> you know, um, note taking. So, yeah, I guess, again, it depends on what you're reading for. But I think, again, when we're reading and um, maybe on some unconscious level, we are reading um for those things anyway and sometimes for the micro things you know you need those little highlighters for for a turn of phrase or vocabulary or or something to that effect that you want to recall but i think there are a lot of macro things that also we're reading for um sometimes you know uh, subconsciously sometimes very actively but yeah this is a little over the top <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't even mean anything. I go to teach this book and I don't even know what these posters mean. <laughs> and, you know, and I can't find the page that I want or the quotation because there are just too many. So. <laughs> um, I will often annotate like that with um, with post-it notes, um, books that I'm reading for, for pleasure. Um, Either when they're uh, going back to the library, and I know I want to write down a passage from them, I want to want to keep that in mind. So I either put it in a sort of um, in a file uh, on on my computer, or I just keep it in a notebook and uh, note where it's from, um, because I'll want to use it for an epigraph, for a poem, or I might want to talk about it in a you know in an essay. And so, um, and I know if I just go, oh, I'll remember that. I'll remember who said that. I will not. So, uh, so even my uh, library books get get stickies on them, so I can write down the things I want before I send them back. And if it's my book, I just keep them keep it in there. And that's you know 
that's for writing, but you know, not for uh, heavy research writing, but for, yeah, just things that I think she has written that better than I will ever be able to. So I might as well quote her and mm -hmm. give her the, you know, and give her the accolade and then go on with what I, I want to say. Right. That's funny. Yeah, actually, the, the the book that like started it all for me, I've obviously been reading a lot, lot long time before this 18 months, but um, there's a line that Sonia Boone uses. And I promise I had that exact same line in my book already. <laughs> but that's, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how that works now. Um, <laughs> So this is this actually is um, because we have uh, because we are you got you you are con you are writing um, continuously and I know um, I've been following Aaron on your social media your your little your writing retreat um, which has been <laughs> totally awesome um, so when you're actually working on a book how do you approach reading do you read books in that genre or do you stay away from them or you know because I remember I had, when I was dancing I had this uh, teacher and when she was choreographing she would she wouldn't watch anything because she didn't want it to influence her so I'm wondering about that with all of you Erin mm -hmm. you can start <laughs> oh I can goodness yeah <laughs> yeah I know some people like um, like if they're working on a middle grade, won't read any middle grades. And some people who are working on a middle grade are like, please give me all the middle grades. Um, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I actively avoid just a handful of books that seem like really close to the same topic. Like when I was writing The Scorpion Rules, which has an AI point of view, um, one, of the, one of the characters in the second book is like, is an artificial intelligence. I avoided other books which had artificial intelligence point of views, which people told me that they would really like, and I, they turned out to be right. I like I did really like Anne Lecky, but I put off reading her till afterwards, and I'm glad I did. Um, so I avoid very specific narrow things um, because I want to develop my own idea, and mostly it's not that I'm afraid that I'm will steal it. It's afraid that I'll go, oh, she already did that. Man, Anne Leckie did it. And I just, you know, I mean, nobody can top it, right? Um, but if you proceed in all ignorance, not knowing that she did it, then you don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mostly read, I write what I like to read, right? I, I write for teenagers because I like to read books for teenagers. I write science fiction because I like to read science fiction. And I generally don't change as I'm, as I'm writing, except in this one little particular way. Um, I know sometimes I read um, quite widely in the genre to find out what I don't have to write because someone has already done it, right? <laughs> and mm -hmm. so um, I've just, I have a uh, book uh, coming out. I have a nonfiction book coming out in uh, the spring. It's called Straggle Adventures uh, in Walking While Female. And so I did read uh, Rebecca Solnit's Wanderlust and thought, how is my book different from hers, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I did read uh, a, a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of white dudes out there um, uh, perceiving nature. And I thought, oh yeah, well, I'm, uh, I won't be writing a book like that, right? So I wanted to to find out where I would be sort of situated in, in the genre of books uh, about walking, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how many women were writing about it? What could I bring to the manuscript that I, I thought was underrepresented in what I uh, in what I was reading? Um, but also, I, I think even as I say that, I know I, I got to a point where I went, okay, that's it, read enough. No, now I know what I'm, uh, you know, what I don't have to do and what I do have to do. Um, but it's one of those things that you could read about a particular subject forever and you're not going to write the book forever. So you have to <laughs> put the brakes on at some point. Mm -hmm. My uh, turnover for drafts is pretty high. So um, I might not read a book while I'm drafting, but while I'm planning the draft or thinking about the draft, I can read pretty much anything except Codename Verity by Elizabeth Wayne, because it's like the best book ever written. So um, I, I, that's my like, when you're done, you can read it. But like, if I read that at any point during the drafting process, it's like, why does anyone write books anymore? <laughs> Elizabeth has written the perfect book. 
Um, so yeah, that's basically how it works for me. Nice. Um, yeah, for me too, I would say I'm, I'm definitely in Tannis's camp. So when I'm thinking about, well, I'm, when I'm in the process um, of writing um, like this um, novel that I've been working on, on Muslim Canadians, I do tend to try and read what's out there. There's not much out there, by the way. It's one of the you. reasons I want to write this book. And, and so, but I, I like to get a sense of, you know, um, again, questions of representation, the gaps in representation, what kind of stories have been told, um, what, um, what's been misrepresented maybe in some way, what can I do better, how can I add to this conversation? So, so more for that, thinking of um, what I'm writing as part of a larger conversation, it does actually help me to, to read other books, either in that genre or within, you know, that um, particular framework um, that I might be working on. And so, yeah, and then there's always a kind of aspirational reading, you know, always having those books at hand that are just by authors you absolutely love and they just give you that boost of inspiration when you need it for your craft. Nice. Um, can you name one, one of your inspiration? Yeah, well, I, I was talking about Shani Mutsu earlier. She was recently um, shortlisted for the Governor General's Award for Polar Vortex, her yes. most recent novel. So she would definitely be somebody um, I would re recommend. She's Caribbean Canadian. And so anytime I read one of her books, I'm just kind of uplifted and I'm, you know, ready to go back at it <laughs> in terms of my own work. She always gives me that dose of inspiration. That's it. I think that that's the important thing um, to have that. So um, there's this thing my parents did when I was when I on my first birthday, um, and it's like a fortune telling silly game that they put down a wine bottle cork, a coin, and a book in front of me to see what I would reach for. Um, so I grabbed the book with both hands. <laughs> um, so um, I don't remember what book it was, but I know I kind of remember this that feeling. Um, what is your earliest memory of holding a book when when it was introduced to you? I know it's a oh. <laughs> my my earliest memories aren't of holding books because my earliest memories of books are my parents reading to me. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um so, that's the earliest for me probably. Yeah. My earliest memory, I don't remember holding a book, but I do remember like reading like Sam and Anne and the dog little readers in kindergarten. And there was, most of them are, let's, let's generously say they're episodic. But there was one that had a plot. <laughs> it was, I actually remember this. It was like, it was a retelling of the Sphinx riddle and the Gordian knot. And I was super into it. And I like snuck it under the table and read it like to see how it would turn out faster than I was supposed to be reading it. <laughs> and that was probably the moment at which I was, was uh, lost my soul to reading like you picking up the book yes. anybody else has a lost their soul moment <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i have a, the making of the uh, of a poet moment um my my parents uh, like raised me on these books that were very much of the 19th century and um i don't know whether it's because they were getting uh, recommendations from my grandparents or or what but anyway um the first book that i held in my hands was robert louis stevenson's uh, child's garden of verse and um, cause it was small, it had pictures that I could look at, and I had started to memorize the poems from hearing them over and over again. So I could read by reciting, and that's part of how I learned to read early was because I already knew that the poem about the shadow went, I have a little shadow that goes in with and out with me, and what's the use of having him is more than I can see, which I can still recite now, <laughs> right? So. Um, yeah, so that was it. My my uh, my nineteenth century <laughs> uh, influences. And for me, very simply, it was the Grimm's uh, fairy tales. That the you know one of those massive collections of fairy tales. I remember. I think I was about six, and it was a gift that my mom gave to me. Um, and other than that, so I was. Um, 
in England for much of my childhood. And so um, things that don't really come up here, like en Enid Blyton, I don't know, do the kids read oh, Enid yeah. Blyton around here? I don't know if they oh, do. I did. I did. Yeah, <laughs> I did. yeah for sure. So Enid Blyton, Roll Dahl, you know? Yep. Um, those were my, my early books. So I guess um, this is there. Um, for, this is for all the parents in the audience. Um, there, there. I'm sure there have to be. I have no stats, but I'm sure there are. Um, how would you inspire, um, sort of, to help build the next generation of readers? Is there any advice that you can give them? Let them read whatever they want, mm -hmm. mm. and it doesn't matter what it is. I was hoping mm -hmm. somebody would say that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. I think. That's I would think be the model reader too, like just, just be a reader, you know, and, and not just um, taking time to read, but also, I would just say joy, you know, just have that joy, joy for books, um, you're working past a bookstore, stop and um, ooh and ah over book covers and titles. And just, um, I think kids just respond naturally to um, your own mood and your own disposition and your own attitude to books. So yeah, be the model reader, just even in terms of your, your engagement and your, your passion for, for books. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, mine are yeah. surrounded with books to the extent that they, they can't get out the door unless they burrow <laughs> through them. So they're all they're taken care of. But I definitely, Kate, Kate has the right of it. These kids, they should get to read what they want to read. Graphic novels are real novels. Audiobooks are real novels. The Dogman books are real novels. When I was in yeah. high school, my dad brought me a Star Trek novel home every Friday, which means I read about 200 of them, which is how many weeks there are in high school. And um, <laughs> most of them probably not great literature, but you'll just have to kind of take my word for it that I turned out okay anyway. <laughs> You know? I, I think and, you did. I'll take the Governor General's <laughs> word for it. Thank yeah. You. yeah. And mine would be make the library a fun place to be. Yeah. Like go mm -hmm. go once a week, every two weeks. If the kids don't want to browse on the shelves, let them play in the computer. Let yep. them do whatever, but make the library a friendly place to be, and they will uh, they will eventually uh, gravitate to uh, to picking up a book once they know it's like their space and they have choice, mm -hmm. right? So this is um, might answer some of the questions that have been coming in to the chat. Um, but I would like to know um, three books that you think everyone should read and why. Ooh. I know, <laughs> I know. Ooh. Oh my goodness. Codename Verity because it is the best book ever written. And yeah, speak slowly because I've been taking notes okay. the whole time. <laughs> Codename Verity by Elizabeth Wayne. That is a really good book. It's so good. It's the only book I've ever finished and immediately started reading again. Oh, you have to, though. Yeah, it's, it's the yeah. only book I've ever done that for. Uh, Stealing Fire by Joe Graham. I'm reading yeah. that right now. I know. I, I told her to. Yeah. A few billion times. Um, and I don't know what my third one is. There's yeah. so many books. So it's okay. Three was a random number. You know. Okay. <laughs> oh, I do have one. It's the Spider-Man Miles Morales uh, YA from Disney a few years ago by Jason Reynolds, um, which in addition to being an amazing Spider-Man book, uh, there's a scene where a bunch of adults are playing spades, uh, the card game, and it is the best single example in writing craft of escalating the stakes I've ever seen in my entire life. Like I got the end of that scene and my heart was pounding and it's just four old guys sitting at a table. Cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, we haven't really been talking poetry, but I'm gonna give you two poetry books that I would recommend. Oh, yes, please. I would recommend Sarah Peter's book, I Become a Delight to My Enemies. I Become a Delight to My Enemies. It's a, um, ah, God, it's a, a, a long, it's like a, a series of uh, long poems about, uh, about feminism and defiance. And I've become a delight to my enemies. So yeah, I, I recommend that. And also um, a book that won all kinds of awards in the States and has been getting some readership uh, in Canada, Ilya Kaminsky's Deaf Republic. Um, um, an allegory about um, deafness and politics and life and death and uh, Ilya Kaminsky. 
Um, I'm kind of resistant to the idea of everybody should read the same three books or any notion of canon. Um, you know, I think there are different books for different people for different moods. Uh, how about if I give you a couple of like books Just that books might change the way you look at the world because nobody's talked nonfiction. Perfect. Um, yes. The World Without Us. I forget who wrote that, but it's, um, oh, I can't come up with it. It's, it's literally like supposing all humans vanished. At hour one, this happened. At hour 10, this happens. And it's kind of a book about the long-term impact of humans on the planet, what we've built that's sustainable, what kinds of things we need to keep doing to keep, you know. So you start out by learning that the New York City subway has all these pumps in it because otherwise it would flood within the hour. And you end by learning that there are gigantic diamond mines in the Northwest Territories that will persist for millions of years. Um, and it will just kind of change the way you think about stuff. And change the way you think about science. There's a book called um, Genie, A Scientific Tragedy, which is a little slim book um, about a child. She's one of these child who was severely neglected to the point where she did not learn to speak. And she was rescued when she was 12. And she, her emergence happened to intersect with this debate in the linguistic community over whether or not there's a critical period for learning language. Uh, critical period means you can only learn it between the ages of say 18 months and three years. And if you miss that, are you just screwed? Um, so it's her story, but it's also the story of the science and then of like the impact that the, the questions asked of her had on her. Um, it's a beautiful book. You'll learn a lot about linguistics and a lot about science. And it's, yeah, it's really good. I recommend that to a lot of people. Oh, That's and great. Susan Bryn Morrow's the, uh, the Names of Things. It also, if you like linguistics about tramping through Egypt, you would like that one, Kate. Yeah. Um, and just to come, The World Without Us um, was by Alan Weizmann. Thank so you. If anybody Sorry about that. that. No, it's not all good. We all, <laughs> everybody looked it up quickly. <laughs> and I would say, uh, going back to the idea of, you know, the the sort of must reads and the book lists, and there's so many out there. I do, and again, questions perhaps of, of underrepresentation. Um, those lists do tend to be very Eurocentric or at least very North American centered over here in Canada, um, the list that we come across. So I would, I would really recommend that you try at least one book in translation every once in a while. So a book that comes from, you know, um, not just from another part of the world, but something written in translation to really break us out of of always reading English um, language work. So that would be, and I would say anything by any Latin American writer would be something I would recommend. Um, you know, whether it's the really well-known ones like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and he has a number of short story collections if you're not into, you know, the big novels like 100 Years of Solitude. Laura Esquivel, the, the Mexican um, writer, um, who just um, transports us into this completely magical world. And especially if you love food and language, you're gonna love <laughs> this book because it combines both of those things. Um, Juan Rulfo, another Mexican magical uh, realist writer. So yeah, work looking at books in, in translation, I think is always a good thing to do. Um, and then again, just maybe breaking out of um, North American um, books and literary traditions, I would really recommend writers um, from some other parts of the world, like um, Kamala Shamsi. I don't know if, if any of you guys have read any works by her. So um, she is a, a Pakistani writer. She actually writes in English and has also been shortlisted for the Booker Prize. So she's very well known, but one of her recent works really, really captivated me. It's called Burnt Shadows. So Burnt Shadows. And it's just this um, incredible book um, that takes on the most sweeping kinds of uh, watershed moments 
difficult, a very difficult subject matter, but she does it in such a way that um, just brings it down to the most personal um, humanizing scale. Um, so things from, you know, the bombing of um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki all the way to the war on terror. And you think, oh, my God, like who, who wants to read this, you know? <laughs> but believe it or not, I mean, she, so it's all through this very interesting network of interrelationships that you don't normally get to see um, in works of literature. Uh, for instance, a Japanese um, woman who's one of the main characters, she's a survivor of um, Hiroshima. So she's a child um, when the Holocaust happens, the nuclear Holocaust happens, then she um, ends up marrying this young Pakistani man in Pakistan. She's a refugee in Pakistan. So it just shakes up our um, axis of... Um, representation. And so I'm always looking for books like that. I'm always recommending books like that, so that sort of take us elsewhere and also take us to new, maybe frameworks of um, relationship and, um, and interrelationship. So those are two. And then another biggie I would recommend is um, Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. It's an, it's an older book. I know it's from the 1980s. Ooh, so old. <laughs> but it's, um, very experimental for its time. It really broke the, um, the back of English literature, like really treating um, English language fiction as, as sort of the holy, you know, something holier than thou. He just broke with all kinds of um, writing styles. You know, he'll have one pay, a one page long paragraph. He'll, he'll combine um, Hindi and Urdu and English words into Hinglish. And so it was very transformative um, as an English language novel, in fact. So, so those would be a couple of recommendations of mine. And one very much more closer to home would be Alicia Elliott's, I mean, speaking of nonfiction, would be Alicia Elliott's The Mind Spread Out on the Ground. Um, just a really a brilliant work of nonfiction, looking at Elliot's own sort of growing understanding of her own indigenous identity. And um, as she wrestles with intergenerational trauma, which I think is like really a must read for, for all of us over here. And, and she just does it brilliantly and masters um, the essay, the, the creative nonfiction essay in ways that I just haven't come across. So it's, it was a real pleasure read as much as a really illuminating read. Yeah, and exactly. I mean, of, of course, there's so many more than just three books or, um, and <laughs> of course, not every book is for everybody, but I still, but this is good because, I mean, I've written down every single book you guys <laughs> talked about today, <laughs> and I'm going to look them up. I'm going to look everything up and maybe the actual book might not be for me, but some similar book would be, which would be, um, you know, I'm, I'm more than, I'm more than happy to try any book. Um, I just have um Really quick question. This is from somebody in the audience. And I, 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 this is kind of a good book. Uh, question, sorry. And probably a good book too. But um, this one's from Andrea. Do you have any books that are palate cleansers in between or when like you're stuck on something to read? Oh, that was my that was my my comedy list, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. It, everyone wants a like a, a comedic book that I recommend. I recommend Allie Bryan's The Figs, F I G G S, um, as a kind of uh, yeah palate cleanser, a, a, a comedic uh, a comedic return, <laughs> or um, almost anything by Susan Juby. Uh, the the BC mm. novelist, um, the Miss Smithers. <laughs> it's a it's a YA book, but uh, Miss Smithers er, that series about um, the young woman going up for the small town beauty contest is a, is a huge favorite for me. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of like resting place books that I read, like when I get a head cold or something. I like the Penderwicks, um, which is a middle grade book about it's just it's a family book it's a very low stakes very sweet very funny book about a big sprawling family and their misadventures um you know there are a few like that i also like to pick up a book of poetry when i just need to stop um and then you can read a page and be satisfied with a page so it literally kind of works the same way 
a bit of parsley would work. It's intense, but you can <laughs> stop there. Yeah. For me, it's romance novels. Um, mm-hmm. And I, there's a couple books that I do reread every year at specific times. Um, but if I'm, if I'm ever stuck or if I'm just like having a bad day and can take the afternoon off or whatever, it's, it's going to be a romance novel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would say, yeah, my fillers are also, I'm with Erin, they, they tend to be short reads. So um, in my case, I've been really starting to get into flash fiction, which is really just, you know, a one paragraph story um, or a one page story. And one that I was, um, I've been so captivated by and I'm reading and rereading um, is the, um, it's a collection called The Group of Seven Reimagined. This is by Karen Schober. She's, a, she's based in Vancouver. And it's, it's a beautiful um, collection of Group of Seven paintings. And it's accompanied by a flash fiction piece by writers from all over the country um, and, and a few international writers as well who respond to that painting. So their, their work of flash fiction is um, in response to one of the paintings in that collection. So it's just, it's, um, yeah, it's just um, a wonderful, wonderful read for me and one I'm, I'm going back to over and over again when I need that kind of, you know, time out. That's really I love it. Yeah, I love that they're like palate cleansers too. See, this is so good for me because I feel I am like I specifically asked to be able to do this panel with you guys because I just wanted to chat with all of you. For, yeah, I feel like I could go on like for the next three or four days talking about this. This has just been so good. I'm literally like my paper is full of notes on the book. So yeah, this has really been, you know, I'm glad that it's for everybody in the audience, but this has really been for me. <laughs> what a good reason to host a panel. Well, why else would you do it, right? I mean, this is, this is it. <laughs> so I can just see my book list getting even bigger now. Mm-hmm. Um, Mine too. <laughs> yeah, I've literally been taking notes on all of it. Um, I guess, okay, so I'll just wait till they, they kick me off. Um, <laughs> So there's another question here that's actually really interesting um, I, because we didn't really talk about audiobooks that much. Um, and I know some of them are harder to translate to audio. I have a hard time personally listening to them because I tune out. I'm, I'm more visual that way. But is there an audiobook that you love that you can recommend just that that was really well done even? So um, I have to tell you, all of the Star Wars audiobooks are incredible. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I have a couple of them now, but there's like sound, music, um, really good readers. They're just so much fun. The first time I heard one, um, I didn't realize that it was going to be like full, uh, full sound and magic. And it was incredible. Nice. You're going to hate me. I mostly listen to audiobooks to fall asleep. My husband reads to me at night, and sometimes I fall asleep, and sometimes I don't, in which case I turn on an audiobook. Uh, right now I'm listening to Terry Pratchett, uh, the Tiffany Aching books, as narrated by Stephen Briggs, and they're really good. Um, I listened to, um, I wish I knew the performer, because she was awesome, but um, you'll find out if you uh, listen to Bernadine Evaristo's Girl, Woman, Other on audiobook, um, the performer who who does it is just it's fantastic. She handles a you know a a, a great swath of characters and um, yeah yeah it was great. And my answer is very simple: no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I I just have not got into audiobooks, and it's nothing against audiobooks. I just I'm too distracted. Like I actually need to to be focused on the page, so yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have a recommendation. All good. Um, so I I can see Maya's here now. So I just wanted to um, hi Maya. Hello. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to again thank you all so much for being here. Um, this has been so amazing for me, and um, I'm sure 
there's quite you'll probably get more questions so expect your social media to blow up in the next few days <laughs> that's right what's better than book recommendations from writers <laughs> thank you all for being here uh, and sharing these insights uh, and your thoughtful conversation with us today your habits as readers um, and why reading is important uh, and i think you were all model readers for us today <laughs> so it's been a joy to listen to you all thank you very much thank you. Uh, and thank you to oops. <laughs> And thank you to everyone tuning in from home. Uh, if you'd like to purchase a copy of any of the books uh, discussed in today's panel by our panelists, uh, please visit our official bookseller for this event, Another Story Bookshop, although I'm sure you can find some of the recommendations there as well. And you can also take a look with our official ebook and audiobook sponsor, Rakuten Kobo. You have until the final day of the festival to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. Visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival you tune in, we'll announce one bonus entry code, and today's bonus entry code is ALLIANCE. If you're interested in having some hands-on experience, consider signing up for some of our workshops. Happening right now, today, 4 p.m. ET, we have Ursula Gray and Bones McKay leading a workshop all about graphic novels, which is also in partnership with KW Writers Alliance. Um, at 6 p.m., we're going to be joined by the Hello Boyfriend Comics Collective, who will be striving to make some really bad sequential art with you all in partnership with the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. And tomorrow, we'll be back with more panels starting at 2 p.m., uh, for epistolary fiction, letters of hope and heartbreak, all about the art of letter writing with Lindsay Ziervogel, Wayne Ng, and Francesca Ekuesi, led by the brilliant Amal El Motar. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists you've heard today, visit our website, toronto.wordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like to support the Word on the Street and the work we do by making a donation, simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. So thanks again for joining us and have a great day.